Mankind has often asked the question, what is the healthiest food? People diet in the pursuit of becoming healthy. But wouldn't it be easier if we could just be a healthy food? Wouldn't we all be better off if we were a bunch of fruit? What then is the perfect fruit? What even is a fruit? Can a fruit become sentient and take over the world? Introducing the pear. A great test subject for this age-old conundrum. Why the pear, you ask? It has a thick skin, sharp top, and sturdy wide base. But more importantly, a nutritious inside containing, and I'm not exaggerating here, every single vitamin in existence. My theory was then, if I could take the pear and rewrite history with it as the dominant species, maybe the whole world would be better off. There was only one way to know for certain, and for that, I would be using the 2008 life simulation game, Spore. If I was going to replace the human race with pears, I would need to go a long way back in time. And because of this, I would be starting my journey at cell stage. My species began as I imagine the human race did as well, hurtling towards the planet on a giant space asteroid. Before I knew it, I was a tiny speck in a very large ocean. But what is that? That's not a pear, that's more like a strawberry or something. We had some work to do. The way to advance in Spore is to collect different body parts and then breed to advance your creature. However, almost immediately, my creature was on the brink of extinction thanks to this huge sea monster. Fortunately, I managed to find a mate before becoming his dinner, and I was now able to make our subject a bit more pear-shaped. Now that we looked the part, the goal was to eat these small floating plants to grow as fast as possible. But the problem was, all of the other pear-looking creatures were getting in the way. To resolve this, I put big huge spikes on my sides, and they seemed to do the job. The spikes were useful, but the real body part I was looking for was this. The omnivore mouth. Oh god, quick run. Oh god, no. Despite being a mouth, the omnivore mouth had a much more useful application. It was the perfect stalk. The only downside to this is that my mouth was now on top of my head, so to eat other creatures or plants I had to perform some sort of 180 trick shot while swimming. That was until I figured out a new ingenious tactic, where my pair would position himself downstream of his prey and simply wait until they swam into his mouth. With this new tactic, the rest of cell stage was a breeze, and before I knew it, my pear had grown a brain. People might not know this, but in real life, pears don't actually have brains. Therefore, this was the furthest pear kind had ever come. But if my guy was going to survive on land, he would need a bit of reshaping. His stalk was moved to the conventional mouth position, and I also gave him some temporary legs just to get him started with the idea of walking, like stabilizers on a bike. The next I knew, he was up and about, and I could begin to rise to the top of the animal kingdom. Not through aggression or power, but through a pair's strongest asset. Charm. Pears have always been charming. You look at a pear in real life and you just think, ah. What a handsome fruit! This game was no different, and upon encountering my first other species, I began to put this to the test. Wait, what? It, it didn't work! I'm sure that was just a glitch, let me, let me just try again. No, what's going on here? Okay, just one more try- No! <clears throat> you didn't see a thing. It was at this point that I discovered my pears could eat meat, which you might think is strange until you realise that the other food in creature stage is fruit, so that's technically cannibalism. It was clear that the other creatures were looking for more than just a charming fruit. They were looking for someone who could sing, something which pears couldn't really do. I mean, the only thing that's going to come out of that mouth is... To solve this, I replaced the flute mouth with one that could sing beautiful, soothing melodies. And finally, we started having some success. With the further expansion of my pear's brain, I decided it was time to remove our legs and go full pear mode. Ah yes, this is exactly how I imagine a pear would move if it became sentient in real life. It was unbelievably slow though. I mean, it was painfully slow. Hmm. If I couldn't go with two legs, and I couldn't go with no legs, why not meet in the middle? It was decided, my pair would hop, and if anything, this only added to how adorable they were. Plus, we could now cover a lot more ground. <gasps> Monkeys. I was now face to face with the human race's ancestors, and they were much stronger than I was. It seemed that to make sure they weren't going to interfere with my plan for world dominance, I would need to befriend some even more powerful allies. Hmm, I guess I could choose these things, or, or maybe this weird thing, or ooh. How about these guys? The Ice Monsters. Sounds pretty powerful to me. Considering their stature, the Ice Monsters would be difficult to impress. However, my pears did what pears do best, and began to roll around. Soon, the Ice Monsters got the memo. And to honour our new alliance, a representative of the Ice Monsters came with us 
us on the rest of our adventure. With him around, progression was easy, and I was able to upgrade our body parts even further. Unfortunately, this did up our speed quite a bit, and the ice monster was struggling to keep up. I felt perhaps I should make another ally, just in case some creature gets a taste of pear, but the ice monster is too far behind to protect us. What about this, this big round bird? This big fat bird? I wanna make friends with this fat bird. With the bird on side, the perfect travelling circus had been formed, and the rest of creature stage was a breeze. Before long, it was time to enter tribal stage. First though, let's track our progress so far. Hmm, yes, it seems we started off as a pear and ended up as a pair, yes. Unfortunately, to enter tribal stage, it was important that my pair had arms, so that he could pick up sticks and start fires. And the advancements didn't end there. The language of pairies was formed, facial hair was invented, and some descendants were born. Don't ask me how, I, I don't know how pairs how, I, I don't know how pairs do that. Most importantly of all, the tribe moved on from the sacred art of singing, and instead ventured into the world of instrumentation. The goal was to rule the world through vibes only, and before long, our first customers presented themselves. The Brown Village. The pairs prepared for their first concert. However, seeing as there's no currency among pairs as of yet, all of the music they played would have to be royalty free, and their set was predominantly made up of Kevin MacLeod songs. Luckily, everyone likes royalty free music, so making allies proved to be really easy. After impressing the brown village, three more villagers were drawn to the area. There was the green village, the blue village who all looked like the alien from the film Alien, and the pink village who were being attacked by a giant flying moose. Feeling unfairly treated after being beaten up by a giant moose, the pink village lashed out. Thankfully, the brown village were very generous, and came to our aid, showering us with gift after gift. Inspired by the brown villagers' kindness, I decided to make amends with the surrounding settlements, by giving them each a basket of fruit. Don't ask where we got the fruit from. And as such, it was now time for our festival tour. Armed with didgeridoos, maracas and pan flutes, we began our tour at the Pink Village, who were particular fans of the song Sneaky Snitch. Then it was on to the Green Village, who fell in love with our rendition of Quirky Dog. The Blue Village, on the other hand, were very fond of the song Carefree. The tour was a major success, so successful that a whole new village was formed completely made up of music critics moving into the area. The Lavender Village. Aside from looking like extras from the first Ice Age movie, this crowd would be hard to impress. The pairs would have to pull out their magnum opus, Kevin MacLeod's finest work, a moving piece titled simply, Who Likes to Party? <laughs> This music was so powerful, it sent us rocketing straight into civilization stage. It was time to make a city. To build a city, we would first need a town hall, which I of course designed in the shape of a pear. We would also need a new form of transportation, and as such, the first ever car was made. In civilization stage, the main form of currency is spice, which is a bit dodgy. Our new automobiles would help us get as much spice as possible. Unfortunately though, pears aren't very good drivers, as they only have short arms, and it took them a while to get used to going in a straight line. In the meanwhile, I got to work on expanding the city. There would be houses in the shape of pears, entertainment establishments in the shape of pears, and factories in the shape of pears. But as I was refurbishing, a whole new city of pears appeared out of nowhere. This wasn't good, but it did present an opportunity to expand, and I would do this through religious conversion. As such, the Church of the Holy Fruit Bowl was formed. The Church of the Holy Fruit Bowl was mostly just for pears, but it sounded grander to include other fruits as well. This religion would have a strict set of rules, and they went as follows. Rule number one, no discrimination except against those associated with bananas. Rule number two, watch at least 10 annoying orange videos each day before midday, and a subsequent 10 before sundown. Rule number three, never eat vegetables, and uh... Love thy neighbour. With our religion formed, it was easy to convert the other pairs to our cause, mostly because they were very impressed with the big holographic pair we were projecting in the sky. I'd assumed that would be the end of that, but within seconds we were being contacted by even more new neighbours. It was the Orange Nation, a subspecies of pear closely related to oranges. Straight out of the bat, they asked us to state our intentions, but seeing as world domination wasn't an option, I had no idea what to say, so I had to settle on religiously converting them instead, and that went down perfectly. Finally, I could have a moment's peace- Oh god, who is it now? 
the forest nation had come to us with a business proposition. Forest pears are a species which grow on the bushes of the forest floor, building huts out of sticks and mud. Well, we're actually running pretty low on sticks and mud at the moment, the deal is on! And now that my nation was engaging in business negotiations, I felt they needed to look a bit more sophisticated. There we go, perfect. The next step towards world domination was now being held up by this big body of water, separating us from the other nations. Therefore, I set about creating a fleet of sea vessels. Unfortunately, pears aren't very good at sailing, as they only have small arms. But before they got the hang of it, another business proposition was in front of us. The purple nation are a breed of pears with strong relation to the plum. And I'm not going to trade with a bunch of filthy plums, no thank you! I was so angered by the purple nation's trade deal that I had to religiously convert another city just to calm down. This city happened to hold the secret to aviation, and I could now make my very own convoy of air vehicles. Or in this case, Pearlocopters. Pearlocopter is a stupid name, that is a really dumb name. Regardless, I decided to sell my whole fleet of cars, and buy a display team worth of air vehicles. Unfortunately, pears aren't very good pilots, as they only have small arms. However, they would have to learn fast, as unwelcome visitors were on the doorstep. The Yellow Nation introduced themselves, and you can guess what they're related to. That's right, bananas. Bananas are not welcome under the Church of the Holy Fruit Bowl, because they would just take up too much space. I mean, have you seen them? They're just so long and unnecessary. These troublemakers needed to be diverted away from bananaism, and quickly, so I sent over the RPF. That's the, uh, that's the Royal Pear Force, because it's like, a, it's like Royal Air Force, but instead of air, you would say pear. Oh great, they've been converted. Moving swiftly on, I continued to butter up the Forest Nation, and it's a good thing I did too, as we would need all their backing in what was to come. The Red Nation had just turned up, and they contacted me with this horrible request. Oh, oh, I ensured them that they would have their money when they pried it from my cold, dead hands. War was declared. I began to religiously convert their first city, but as I did so, they began to attack our city. To cancel this out, I began to convert another one of their cities, but before I could, they'd already taken back their original city, and began attacking another of mine. So I called an attack on my original city, meaning their forces stopped attacking the city I'd just converted, and instead went to stop my attack. Therefore, I was able to claim the second of their cities, at which point they resorted to mind games, declaring that the planet trembles before their mighty armada. They then began attacking me again, so I stole all of their spies. Thankfully, after all this messing around, the Red Nation were as weak as a breadstick, and with one final push, my pears were victorious. To honor our alliance, the Forest Nation decided to merge with us, and pears worldwide celebrated our victory. We now ruled the entire planet. But why stop at just one planet? I took over this one, so why shouldn't I take over the moon, for example, or the whole solar system? Maybe even the galaxy! It was decided. Pairs would venture into space, and after inventing the space shuttle, one brave astronaut took to the skies. Unfortunately, pairs aren't very good at flying space shuttles, as they only have small arms. Uh, this is Alpha Bravo Bravo Tango 69er. We seem to be experiencing some turbulence, maybe got, got a little bit of an issue here. Oh god, we're going down there, yay, mate! The crash caused disarray amongst pear communities, and after a load of bad PR, which of course stands for pear reputation, the bananas, who had previously been marginalised by the Church of the Holy Fruit Bowl, took their opportunity and decided to invade. Even the plums weren't safe. And after years of turmoil, the pear species devolved all the way back to creature stage, and were eventually made extinct. Aside from one. The very same pilot whose crash had started it all. Fruitius Maximus. And, using a time machine of his own invention, Fruitius has been able to teleport himself back several years to within the midst of the Bananas' occupation. With the help of famous detective Pear Fessor Layton and a small group of other pairs, Fruitius begins his journey for revenge. Having time travelled back, Fruitius explained the situation to Pear Fessor Layton. After hearing his story, the Pearfessor decided to show Fruitius the remains of their most recent battle, to see if he could deduce anything from it. Hmm, yes, he thought. This seems to be a banana. Better taste to make sure. Yes, definitely a banana. Just for peace of mind, though. Yes, definitely a banana. Not only did this mean that Fruitius was in the right time period, but it meant that bananas were nearby. All he had to do was find them and take them down. 
With this in mind, he set out in search of more information, and before long, he came across a local tribe of Orangers. Having previously been members of the Church of the Holy Fruit Bowl, the Orangers were willing to help, and they communicated all they knew to him through the medium of song. After hearing all of the horror stories these Orangers had to offer, Frutius realised something. He couldn't do this alone, and after equipping himself with some new short arms, he set out in search of some allies, stumbling first across a nest of plums. Perfect! Plums had always been strong supporters of pear kind, and Frutius began to approach them peacefully. Suddenly though, another type of plum stormed out of the wilderness. A horrible mutated species, deformed by years of nuclear warfare. Frutius was so terrified that he had to turn tail and run. But he had to try again. He thought it safer this time if he brought Pearfessor Layton with him, just for moral support if nothing else. And, checking the coast was clear, he set off towards the plums again. Same problem, different minute. The aggressive species of plums seemed to be guarding the plum's nest, and if Frutius was going to reach the nice plums, they would have to get past him. The only option was to fight. Initially, Frutius and the Pearfessor seemed to have the upper hand, but then another mutated plum jumped out of the bushes, and they were outmatched. It was all going horribly wrong. Could this be the end already? Frutius knew what he had to do, and Leaving the Pearfessor painfully behind, he ran towards his time machine, and jumped back in time once more. Restarting from the beginning, he decided to approach the plums straight away, and now knowing where the aggressive plums were hiding, him and the Pearfessor were able to dispatch them with relative ease. Finally, he could begin to make allies. The plums thanked him for freeing them, and then proceeded to tell him of a shocking rumour. They'd heard whispers of a banana outpost just a little west from here. Frutius felt nervous, but he knew he had to check it out, and without further ado, he set out and travelled directly west. Before long, he spotted something on the horizon, and all of his darkest suspicions were confirmed. Bananas. Upon setting sight on the bananas, him and the Pearfessor both lost their cool. They were so angry, in fact, that they couldn't hold themselves back, and began to attack the bananas right away. Immediately, the golfing combat ability was clear, and in a matter of moments, Frutius was once again jumping back in time and restarting everything afresh. If that's how powerful the bananas were, then this was really bad news. Frutius had two options. One was to try and evolve himself in the other pairs close enough to their previous stature that they could take the bananas head on. But in this world of mutated monsters, that would be a difficult task. The other option was to find an ally strong enough to do the dirty work for him. He settled on the second option, but after several hours of travelling, he still couldn't find a creature powerful enough. And as the rain began to pour, all seemed lost. That's when he saw them. The most majestic specimen he'd ever seen. It was a whole nest of long boys. They were so long, so beautiful, and yet they had such a menacing presence. This was the creature that would help them defeat the bananas, but what could just a lowly pair offer such a magnificent beast? There was no way they could befriend even a single long boy, particularly not as they were now. The process had become even more complicated. They would have to evolve and then befriend a creature to help them impress Longboy, who in turn would help them defeat the bananas. With this new plan in mind, the whole tribe of pairs decided to move out to a new headquarters, taking a plum with them as a team mascot. Hopefully, around here there would be some impressive species that even Longboy couldn't turn down. And, as luck would have it, the answer was only a few feet away. Monkeys. This was perfect. If there's one thing we all know about monkeys, it's that they're great dancers. With a monkey on the team, Longboy was bound to be won over. Both pears and plums sang their hearts out, and in no time, the monkeys were on side. Sadly, at this point, the plum decided to depart, as his people needed him back home. But his contribution to the cause would never be forgotten. The pears and monkey went the opposite way, and thanks to the monkey's advice on facial grooming, pears as a species evolved more and had now grown back their signature moustaches. All they had to do now was track down the long boys again, and after taking directions from a bunch of mutated pears, they found them. With a combination of the monkey's dancing and the pears' charm, negotiations with the long boys were going well. That is, until a banana bombing raid interrupted proceedings. 
During this pandemonium, surrounding mutated creatures began to attack. And tragically, and without warning, Perfessor Layton was brutally killed. Fruitius was heartbroken. Perfessor Layton had been his greatest friend ever since he time-travelled back from the future. How could he go on without his most trusted sidekick? Was this cause even worth it if more casualties like this one lay ahead? Fruitius was so sad that the game crashed. But after reloading the game, Professor Layton was back and the day was saved. With the crew back together, they were able to finally befriend a long boy. Long boy expanded Fruitius' mind by telling him all about Long Earth. Huh, crazy, I'd always thought it was flat. And although his long neck was so long that it blew about in the breeze, with Longboy in tow, they all decided it was finally time to fight the Bananas again. This was the moment of truth. If they were to defeat the Bananas, the time was now. And without hesitation, the team charged forwards with an all-out attack. Yet again, the battle started well. But the collective might of the Bananas was too much power to handle. Their thick peel left them impervious to any damage. Fruitius and the team lost the fight, and he once again had to jump back in time. One thing was certain, if Fruitius couldn't get through the banana's thick peel, there was no way he would defeat them. So him and the other pairs decided they would get claws. Having witnessed Longboy tragically fall to the bananas, Fruitius now knew it was unfair to employ others into what was essentially a pair orientated issue. And, thinking about this, he came up with a new idea. Even with their claws, Fruitius knew that his group of pairs weren't strong enough to beat a banana one-on-one. -on -one. But what if there were pairs out there that were already much stronger? After all, it wasn't just plums that had been mutated. In fact, Fruitius had asked some mutated pairs for directions just a little earlier. It was decided. Fruitius would search the land to recruit more mutated pairs, and it was only a small bit of travelling later that he hit the jackpot, and came across the tallest and most intimidating looking pairs he'd ever seen. With one of these big boys on the team, there was no way they would lose, and after parting ways with the monkey in what was again an emotional farewell, the team recruited a four-legged pair as well, and began to march in the banana's direction. As they reached the banana hideout this time though, Fruitius decided they needed to be more tactical. Running in head first hadn't worked so far, and so, they waited cautiously until one foolish banana separated himself from the bunch. Then, they pounced. And before it knew it, the banana had been taken out by the ultimate pair wombo combo. More fruit punches followed, as bananas and pears scrapped for supremacy. Big Boy was doing some great work, but sadly, Four Legs was struggling and the Bananas, now full of potassium, were able to get the better of him. The fight wasn't over though, and Big Boy had the power of 10 pairs, maybe even 11 pairs at a push, and with Fruitius and Perfessor Layton providing support, they were able to wipe out the rest of the Bananas and end this horrible war. They had done it, the pairs had won, and the world could be at peace again. But as Fruitius went to inspect the bodies, Yep, definitely banana. He found that one banana was carrying a note. He read it aloud, and what it said shocked him to his very core. Assignment for Banana Camp 14B. Hunt down and take care of pair sympathizers. This told Fruitius two things. On the one hand, this was clearly not the only banana encampment. In fact, by the sounds of it, there were at least 13 other encampments just in Sector B. He assumed the B stood for banana. There was some positives though. Hunt down the pair sympathizers. What did this mean? Whoever these pair sympathizers were, the bananas were clearly worried about them. Fruitius had to find them. They could be the key to taking down the banana empire. With the new mission in place, Fruitius returned to the other pairs and they all moved out to find a new headquarters, which would let them scout further afield for these pair supporters. At the same time, now the battle was over, Fruitius wanted rid of his claws, so he experimented with a few other options. Maybe some crab hands so he could snip people with his crab hands. Or maybe some huge talons. No, they were too scary. Not even pair sympathizers would approach them with those. He settled eventually on a pair of warm mittens, and he was sure that there was absolutely no way that having zero dexterity of his fingers would ever hinder him in the future. And with peace of mind and some very snug hands, Fruitius and Big Boy parted ways with tears in their eyes, and the pair tribe set out to find whoever it was that was on their side. Could it be these creatures? 
No, probably not. Could it be these handsome looking fellas? No, not them either. And then, something awful happened. Fruitius stumbled upon yet another banana encampment. Paralyzed with fear, Fruitius thought this could be the end. But something was different. These bananas seemed to be able to dance. Very uncharacteristic for such a stuck up and aggressive fruit. And what's more, when they approached, the bananas didn't attack. It couldn't be. Were these bananas really the pair sympathizers? This was a huge stroke of luck. Having friends on the inside of the Banana Empire could prove really useful going forwards. And after speaking to the leader of the group, a guy named Bananakin Skywalker, they formed an alliance, traded information, and readied themselves for tribal stage. According to Bananakin, the Banana Empire went much, much deeper than Fruitius had ever thought. Tribal stage was gonna be tough. They were about to move into a world of spears and flaming torches, and as such, each pair was equipped with a warrior's helmet, shoulder pads, and a grass skirt. The task ahead would be difficult, but there were two main things that gave Fruitius hope. For one, they had Bananakin now, a man on the inside who could act as a spy, and more importantly, Fruitius remembered the Brown Village. In his previous life, the Brown Village had always been there, to help pairs through thick and thin. They gave them gifts, sang them songs. The Brown Village truly were the nicest village on the whole planet. Now that the pairs were in tribal stage again, he was sure that the Brown Village would be willing to help them out. In fact, here they were now. <gasps> no. It couldn't be. Impossible. Oh no. The Brown Village had been taken over by bananas. In a state of shock, Fruitius decided he couldn't tell the rest of the tribe. It would break their spirits. They were busy befriending and taming the local population of melons, but Fruitius had to save the Brown Village. For all he knew, they could be being held hostage. How was he gonna do this all by himself? He had no idea. Then, when all seemed hopeless, something completely unexpected happened. On the horizon, Fruitius spotted the giant silhouette of a human man. It was an epic Eren Jaeger, and it wasn't at all far away from the Brown Villager's base. Fruitius came up with a genius but dangerous plan. If he could free the Brown Village though, he was willing to risk it all. And without further ado, he set out alone, directly towards the epic Eren Jaeger. His plan was to draw Eren Jaeger's attention towards himself. Then he would kite Eren towards the Brown Village and have him do the dirty work instead. It took a few tries because, as it turned out, Eren Jaeger was a little bit afraid of crowded spaces. But after kiting him towards the bananas again and again, he eventually took the bait. And, while the banana chieftain chased Eren away, Fruitius began to attack the village. Within a second, the banana chief had returned, and Fruitius's plan was in tatters. But hearing the distant cries of warfare, the rest of the pairs appeared as backup, and an all-out battle commenced. Eren Jaeger continued to wreak havoc in the background, but it seemed that Fruitius had underestimated his comrades. They were in this together after all, and with an almighty team effort, and despite fighting the banana's best soldier, Farmer Bobbins, they brung the brown village to its knees. Unfortunately though, there was still no sign of the original Brown Village, and with a bunch of wild mutated plums attempting to steal their food, the pairs headed back to base empty mittened. Fruitius had not yet given up hope that the original Brown Village was still out there, and with this, he set about scouting out the other tribes in the area. There was the Green Village, who were a bunch of bananas, the Scion Village, who were a bunch of bananas, and the Pink Village, who were being attacked by another epic. This time, it was the Cart Titan. This was perfect. Fruitius could employ the same technique he had just used. Attacking the Pink Village base would be easy if they were distracted by the Cart Ti- What? As if by magic, it seemed the Cart Titan had vanished into thin air. Well, there goes that plan, thought Fruitius. It seemed he would be relying on Eren Jaeger once again. He chose the Scion Village as his next targets, once again kiting Eren Jaeger over towards their base. All was going well, but just as Eren Jaeger was about to lay waste to the Scion Village, the Pink Village, having scared away the Cart Titan, began to attack the other pairs. Fruitius rushed back just in time. The Pink Village were no match for the pairs' combined attacks, and even Bananakin Skywalker helped out to defend their home. The Pink Village were repelled for now. 
Not wanting to be attacked by everyone around them, Frutius and the tribe decided to change tactics. They needed to make at least some allies, and with this in mind, they equipped themselves with didgeridoos. Now, the only question was, who did they try and befriend? And then, the answer presented itself. The green village had walked past, and began fishing in a spot nearby. This was curiously peaceful behaviour for a bunch of bananas, and the pairs decided to take a chance and put on a concert for them. Seeing as the pairs weren't allowed any money by the Banana Empire, they could only play royalty-free music. But luckily, everyone loves Kevin MacLeod songs, and they managed to win the Green Villagers Fisherman over by playing one of his greatest pieces, a song called Meatball Parade. It took a little while as the fisherman seemed to have an obsession with maracas, but once he came around on the didgeridoos, he informed Fruit of some wonderful news. The Green Village were housing refugees of the original Brown Village, and although the Brown Villagers chieftain had sacrificed himself to save the others, the rest were safe. Frutius wanted to know more, but the conversation was cut short by an attack from the Cyan Village, who were still mad that Frutius had brought Eren Jaeger towards their base. The assault was tough, and the pairs were on the back foot. But just in time, the Green Village arrived with gifts from the Brown Village refugees. Even in their darkest hour, it seemed the Brown Village was still the nicest village in the world. And because of this, the pairs were able to withstand the Cyan Village's attack. To solidify their relationship with the Green Village, the pairs decided to put on another concert. This time with the addition of the fisherman's favourite instrument, the Maracas. It was a great success, and the celebrations went on long into the night. This gave Frutius an idea. Another distraction tactic, which didn't involve quite as much risk. He called it Operation Didgeridon't. His plan was to pretend to befriend the Cyan Village by giving them a gift and holding them a concert. And as they enjoyed the music, the rest of the pairs would attack from behind. Putting the plan into action, Frutius and his understudy, a pair named Obi-Wan Pear Nobi, turned up at the Cyan village and began to play their instruments. Meanwhile, the rest of the tribe snuck around the back of the village, and at the opportune moment, they struck. The battle was over in seconds. The bananas were caught completely unaware, and the pears were victorious. But it seemed it wasn't just Frutius who had been thinking strategically. And when they returned home, they found the pink village had been attacking while they were away. Bananakin Skywalker had been bravely holding the fort, but as the pairs returned to deal with the pink invaders, he suffered a whole load of damage, and with fighting happening all over the place, he was regrettably caught in the crossfire. Bananakin was dead. The pink village would have to pay for what they had done. Bananakin was such a brave soul, who had sacrificed so much to help those in a lesser situation than his own. Frutius knew what must be done. Operation Didgeridon't 2.0. While preparing for this operation, a new village turned up in the area. It was a tribe of melons. Perfect, another ally to get on side. But that would have to wait, as the pink village were advancing at a fast pace, and had already created a hover car which they were using to abduct native pairs. With their didgeridoos in hand, Frutius and Obi-Wan Pear Nobi began to perform in front of the pink village, and as they were distracted, the tribe once again snuck round the back. The attack was just as effective as the first time. They took out the town hall in several swift and coordinated motions, and the pink village was no more. Now that that was over, the pairs could make friends with the tribe of melons. They decided to play Kevin MacLeod's most prestigious song, Who Likes to Party, to really impress their future allies. But as the concert was going on, Eren Jaeger turned up and began attacking the band. Before they could finish, Eren had taken out so many band members that they couldn't continue the song. The melons saw this and decided to help out. With a tag team of the remaining pairs and the sheer might of the Melon army, both fruits together were able to defeat arguably the most powerful creature in all the world. And after a quick recuperation, the pairs finished their concert and prepared to advance into civilization stage. But just before they could, the Melons told them something vitally important. Bananas weren't inherently evil. Frutius had been wondering about this for some time. Although some of the bananas he'd come across were pretty nasty, some of them, such as Bananakin Skywalker and the Green Village, were actually quite nice. No, 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 said all the melons simultaneously. The bananas are simply being used. The real ones to watch out for is the Yellow Nation. In Frutius's previous timeline, the Yellow Nation had been a species of pears very closely related to bananas. 
And heeding the melon's advice, Fruitius and the team advanced to civilization stage with the utmost caution. If Fruitius was going to have to infiltrate the Yellow Nation, he was taking no chances. And as such, he and the pairs decided to make themselves vehicles to drive in the shape of bananas to act as a form of camouflage. Upon establishing a capital city, Buenos Peris, the immediate goal was to collect spice. In civilization stage, spice is the main form of currency, specifically Chinese five spice. The pear nation would need a lot of this if they were going to convert the whole world back into the Church of the Holy Fruit Bowl. And when they gathered up enough of it, they began to religiously convert every nation in Buenos Peris' immediate vicinity. The Crimson Nation and the Orange Nation were quickly persuaded. But then came an ominous phone call. The Yellow Nation had made contact. Fruitius was so unprepared that he hung up on them immediately. If they were going to defeat the Yellow Nation from the inside, they would need to appear as unthreatening as possible, so as to not raise any suspicion. To do this, they made boats in the shape of bananas as well, and set out to perform a tactic that Fruitius called the Trojan Banana. They would sail to the Yellow Nation and attempt to get inside the city by offering the banana boats as gifts. But there was one thing that could give them away. Pears couldn't drive boats very well as they were wearing mittens, which meant they had zero dexterity of their fingers. What's more, once they found the Yellow City, their arms were so short that they couldn't reach it. Fruitius was so frustrated by this that he had to religiously convert the Red Nation just to calm down. But as he moved to convert the Pink Nation as well, something brightened his spirits. A call from some old friends. The Forest Nation of Pears were offering to set up a trade route together. With the Forest Nation's backing, the Pears were able to convert the Pink and Blue Nation, and now finally, they could move on to the... <gasps> oh dear! The Yellow Nation were attacking the Brown City, a city set up by the Green Tribe through their coalition with the Brown Village refugees. As many banana boats as possible attempted to head over to the scene, but they were so bad at driving that by the time they received the Brown Nation's call for help, it was too late. The Yellow Nation had taken over. If Fruitius wanted to liberate the Brown Nation, then now was as good a time as any to perform Operation Trojan Banana 2.0. But as one brave banana car tried to stealth into the city, they were spotted and blown up in an instant. Even with several banana cars, the operation was not a success. And it was here that Fruitius realised that attacking over land and sea would not be enough. They would have to improve on their predecessor's previous invention, the Pearlocopter. And with this, Fruitius invented the pear plane. Assembling an army of pear planes would take a long time, and as Buenos Peris worked their hardest, the Yellow Nation took their opportunity and conquered city after city. Even the Forest Nation weren't safe, but as the fleet of pear planes grew, they practiced piloting even despite their short arms and mittens, and Fruitius promised himself that he and the other flyers would liberate everyone. Meanwhile, more and more cities fell and eventually, the Yellow Nation had conquered half of the world. Finally though, the Royal Pair Force, which is the pair equivalent of the Royal Air Force, was ready, and the pair planes were more powerful than anybody could have anticipated. They swept across the skies, religiously converting everything in sight. Each city was retaken in the blink of an eye, and pairs worldwide began to believe again. The Yellow Nation could do nothing to stop them. The pair planes were simply too many, and with one final ultimate move, each pair plane directed their projector beams towards each other, creating one huge holographic pair. All pairs who looked up and saw it were filled with hope, and the Banana Nation fell apart like the biscuity topping of a nice pear crumble. The world was saved. Fruitius had done it, but there was one more thing he needed to do to get closure. The engineers entered the workshop just as they had done in Fruitius's previous timeline. He was gonna do it this time. He wasn't gonna crash, and he was gonna take pairs to space. But as he took off, the same old problems came back to bite him in the arse. His arms were still too short. After all of this time, and to make it worse, his mittens meant he couldn't even press any of the buttons in his spaceship to try and rectify himself. Fruitius was panicking, but then came a phone call. It was Pearfessor Layton. You can do it, Fruitius. Just move your seat closer to the steering wheel. The Pearfessor was right. Fruitius thought back. They had come through so much together. He was so glad to have the Pearfessor as a sidekick. Fruitius moved his seat forward, and with one last monumental effort, 
he took control of the spaceship, engaged full upwards thrust, and finally entered outer space. And nowadays, when little pairs ask their parents for a bedtime story, they often speak about Fruitius the Brave. The fruit who took one small step for pears, and one giant leap for pear kind. Mr. Pinchy was feeling very adventurous, and it wasn't long before he began to discover some strange things in his surroundings. On the ground was what seemed to be the dismembered body of some sort of fruit. What kind of a world was this that he'd found himself in? He decided to do some more travelling to find out, and eventually stumbled across some other species. First, a nest of sea cucumbers. Interesting, thought Mr. Pinchy, but crabs have very poor attention spans, and after getting bored, he continued on his journey, stumbling next across a nest of forest pears. Weird, thought Mr. Pinchy, before getting bored again and immediately moving on. Some more travelling later, and he came across a nest of plums. Lovely, thought Mr. Pinchy, before getting bored again and walking away. With all this walking and travelling, Mr. Pinchy was beginning to get hungry. But as his small crab stomach rumbled, he realised something. Mr. Pinchy was surrounded by a buffet of different food-based creatures. It was his lucky day, and he began to chow down on his favourite food, sea cucumber. Admittedly, Mr. Pinchy did get a bit carried away, but after wiping out the majority of the sea cucumber population, he went back home and it was time to evolve. Just give me a second here, just doing some admin, okay. Big improvements needed to be made if I wanted Mr. Pinchy to eventually rule the land, and I started by giving him some arms and some proper crab claws. With his new arms waving in the air as he scuttled side to side, I knew that I was on the right track, and Mr. Pinchy headed back over to the forest pears to begin his next meal. But as he got there, he looked directly into the forest pear's kind eyes. And at that moment, Mr. Pinchy's tiny crab heart tripled in size, and he decided that rather than eat them, he would befriend them instead. Not only did this increase Mr. Pinchy's heart size, but his brain grew bigger as well. And with his improved IQ, I sent him out further afield to discover more of what this world has to offer. Within a few moments, Mr. Pinchy was face to face with a group of long boys, who proceeded to tell him about Long Earth. Then Mr. Pinchy met a group of aggressive plums. He likes the other plums better. And finally, he stumbled across another nest of pears, one of which claimed to be called Fruitius Maximus, what a strange name. But as Fruitius Maximus began to tell him of his story, Mr. Pinchy became bored and was distracted by what seemed to be a huge mountain moving in the distance. Upon closer inspection, Mr. Pinchy was struck with horror. It was one of the crab species' biggest nemesis, a whelk. In real life, whelks may look innocent, but in reality, they're doing a load of horrible stuff behind the scenes. Committing tax fraud and siphoning charity income into their personal bank accounts. This whelk was no different, apart from the fact that this whelk was giant. And that meant it was dangerous too. Mr. Pinchy ran away as fast as his little crab legs would carry him, but the whelk was tenacious, and if it wasn't for his incredible sneaking abilities, and the fact that the whelk was distracted by Fruitius Maximus and the other pairs, he may not have escaped with his life intact. If Mr. Pinchy was going to defeat his arch nemesis, he had a long way to go. And after some upgrades, just a second here, let me just add this here and this here, he set about leveling up by beating up various other creatures in the surrounding area. These fights went so successfully that Mr. Pinchy was feeling pretty happy about himself, and he proceeded to jump and flip about with joy. Even the rain couldn't get his spirits down. But after jumping and skipping about a bit too far, he once again came across the giant whelk. As before, the whelk charged with ferocious pace, and Mr. Pinchy was forced into another retreat. Once again, he barely escaped with his life, and I realised I would need to give Mr. Pinchy some even more serious upgrades. It was at this point, I knew it was time. Being a normal crab would no longer be good enough. Mr. Pinchy would have to enter... Hermit Crab Mode. His shell was majestic far more graceful than that filthy giant whelk. Furthermore, it seemed all that rain that Mr. Pinchy had been skipping about in earlier had resulted in flowers and moss growing around his back. He was looking cuter than ever, 
but as he set out again to show his new appearance to the world, he had yet another encounter with the giant whelk. Thank God Mr. Pinchy was so sneaky, and after a short chase scene, he escaped for a third time. But then, just as he was settling in back home, ah! the giant whelk had followed him back to the crab's nest, and Mr. Pinchy and his family were driven from their house. That blasted whelk was gonna pay for what he'd done, thought Mr. Pinchy, but how would he ever defeat it? It was so giant, and so whelk. He couldn't do this alone, and with that, he decided to search for a new ally. Luckily for him, the flowers on Mr. Pinchy's back made him so charming that everyone wanted to be friends. Unfortunately, nobody around these parts seemed strong enough, that is, until a rogue stepped into view. In Spore, a rogue is a super species with almost 10 times the health of a normal creature. Mr. Pinchy had struck gold, and with the rogue by his side, all future scuffles and fights were over in an instant. The rogue's fighting style was like nothing he'd ever seen before. All he had to do was sit back, and the rogue would rip his enemies apart in front of his eyes. Before long, Mr. Pinchy was ready to move into tribal stage, and then the game crashed and I had to play through the whole thing again, which I'm not salty about at all, but eventually, the time came. Mr. Pinchy discovered fire, set up a small tribe, and began to work on his plans for world domination. These plans were immediately put aside though, as on the horizon, the silhouette of the giant whelk appeared once more. Should Mr. Pinchy attack now? Was he strong enough yet to take the giant whelk down? But before he could answer these questions, a new village of pears was established nearby. It was the Pink Village. This gave Mr. Pinchy an idea. Although he hadn't really been listening to Frutius Maximus' story, as far as he understood it, the pears were some sort of freedom-fighting group. He also knew that Pears loved nothing more than royalty-free music. Maybe if Mr. Pinchy made friends with the surrounding Pear villagers, he'd be able to get them to help him defeat the giant Welk. Without wasting another second, he set up his own shop full of didgeridoos, handed them out to his crab family, and they skipped over to the Pink Village for a crab concert. The Pink Village were impressed, and they gave the crabs tens across the board. The plan was going well, and more pet villagers moved into the area to hear Mr. Pinchy's beautiful royalty-free music. Now there was the Green Village, the Lavender Village, and the Cyan Village, who were about to be attacked by the giant Welk! Watch out, Cyan Village! No! This was Mr. Pinchy's chance. If his tribe and the Cyan Village worked together, they might just have a shot of taking the Welk down. He and the other crabs rushed across as quickly as their little crab legs would carry them, and surrounded the Welk as best they could. With both tribes attacking at once, the Welk knew it was outmatched, and it proceeded to try and make a getaway. Mr. Pinchy and the other crabs gave chase. They wouldn't let him get away. All Mr. Pinchy had done so far was run away himself, and now the tables were turned, he had to capitalize. The giant Welk was unbelievably fast. But before long, things took a turn for the best. In its panic, the Welk had headed straight from the Cyan Village towards the Green Village, and both tribes together would be able to corner it again. The Welk was now trapped, as both Cyan Village, Crab Village, and Green Village began to attack it as a team. But, as it turned out, the Green Village weren't quite as accommodating as Mr. Pinchy had thought. Rather than being helpful, they were actually annoyed that Mr. Pinchy had chased the giant whelk in their direction. And, instead of joining the fight, the Green Village began attacking Mr. Pinchy and his friends. As the whelk continued to be whittled down, Mr. Pinchy's tribe fell to the Green Village one by one. It was a race against time. Who would drop first? And then, with one last roar, the whelk finally keeled over. It was defeated. Mr. Pinchy had achieved his goal. As the Green Village kept on attacking, Mr. Pinchy closed his adorable crab eyes in satisfaction. Sure, the Crustacean Nation never finished taking over the world, but they sure did finish taking over that Welk. With nothing more to do, the big moment awaited. And, with a little bit of encouragement, Mr. Fishfingers took a deep breath, <gasps> held it in, and made his way onto land. Seeing as Mr. Fishfingers had no legs, his only option was to bounce and flop about. 
but Mr. Fishfingers was so happy to be out of the ocean that he somersaulted his way around with joy, and eventually came across some more creatures. It was a catfish, and wanting to maintain the brotherhood that all fish shared, Mr. Fishfingers decided to make friends with them. Feeling good about this new friendship, he continued on his journey, jumping and skipping through the grass until <gasps> some human beings went speeding past. This was bad news. Humans were famous for doing a lot of fishing, and if Mr. Fishfingers was correct, he was a fish. For now though, they had gone, and Mr. Fishfingers was able to flop on past, eventually reaching another nest of creatures. This time, it was a group of koi carp. These koi carp were incredibly wise, and they proceeded to give Mr. Fishfingers some introspective advice. But if there's one thing a salmon hates, it's introspection. If Mr. Fishfingers really thought about it, then salmon should really just stay in the water. And this was a reality that he was not yet prepared to face. He opted instead to eat the entire koi population, and with all that wisdom digesting in his stomach, Mr. Fishfingers felt a little bit smarter. With this newfound intelligence, he realised that instead of merely passing by the other fish around him, he could maybe recruit them to his cause. Then he realised that eating all of the koi carp might not have been his best move. There were of course still catfish though, and with a catfish on side, the party went back to the salmon's base, and Mr. Fishfingers prepared to evolve. Now a far more intimidating creature than he was before, Mr. Fishfingers felt confident enough to go and explore further afield. It wasn't long, however, before he ran into trouble. The humans he had seen earlier had set up camp nearby, but Mr. Fishfingers was a new salmon now, and he reckoned he could take them. With one big run-up, he thrust himself straight towards the human's face, but he was then beaten to a pulp. Thankfully, Mr. Fishfinger's catfish friend rushed in to save him, and he was only just able to escape. That catfish's sacrifice would never be forgotten. Wounded and on the verge of collapse, Mr. Fishfinger's might not have survived had he not stumbled across his next allies, a group of trout. The trouts took him in, cared for him, and by the time he made way, he was accompanied by their greatest warrior, Timothy, Timothy Trout. With Timothy by his side, Mr. Fishfingers felt unstoppable, and he was able to defeat some more species in the surrounding area to increase his fighting ability. By the time he returned home, oh look, the salmon were migrating, a sign of the fish's advancement, and following suit, he and Timothy ventured after them. Along the way were many dangerous creatures, a bunch of aggressive plums, and most notably, the humans once again. You killed Colin the Catfish, screamed Mr. Fishfingers as he launched into battle. The humans were startled and began to make a retreat. Mr. Fishfingers thought he had won, but it was all just military tactics. And after foolishly charging into their ranks, Mr. Fishfingers was beaten up so badly that the game crashed. It was back to square one. Mr. Fishfingers had to defeat the plums all over again. And oh look, the salmon are migrating. This time, Mr. Fishfingers made sure to keep out of the human's way, but he swore that one day he would get his revenge, and maybe steal their legs too while he was at it. After travelling past some orangutans, and being chased by some rather unfriendly lobsters, they finally made it to the salmon's new base. Here, Mr. Fishfingers took the opportunity to once again evolve, and then he died immediately to the next creature he saw, and the game crashed. <sighs> Oh look, the salmon are migrating. This time, Mr. Fishfingers would get things right. Oh, uh, nope, he's died to the plums. Oh, for God's sake. Oh, look, the salmon are migrating. I swear to God, I was playing Spore on Minecraft Hardcore mode. It wasn't just Hardcore mode for Mr. Fishfingers, however, and the next time he engaged the aggressive plums in combat, Timothy Trout tragically passed away. A great servant to the cause, and more than anything, a dear friend. On the upside though, he tasted delicious. With Timothy's memory in his heart, and his body in his stomach, Mr. Fishfingers snuck back past the humans, swearing once again to steal their legs, then back past the lobsters, and finally, he arrived at the salmon's new base again.
After evolving for a second time, Mr. Fishfingers took the opportunity to get back at the lobsters who had chased him before. But once the fray had died down, he stumbled across a creature who melted all the anger in his heart away. His name was Mr. Pinchy, and he was an adorable crab. It turned out that Mr. Pinchy was attempting to establish something known as the Crustacean Nation, and although he may have purposely forgot to inform him of the murder of several dozen lobsters, Mr. Fishfingers and Mr. Pinchy made an agreement to work together for the sake of underwater creatures everywhere. As such, they moved out and began to wreak havoc on the rest of the world. With Mr. Pinchy's help, there was nothing that could stand in their way, and, following a memorial service for Timothy Trout at the Trout's Nest, it was finally time to bring justice to the humans that had haunted fish kind for so long. Mr. Fishfingers once again went flying in for the kill, almost too enthusiastically this time, but it was this enthusiasm that had the humans outmatched. And, before long, the Salmon Crab Alliance was victorious. This could only mean one thing. Salmons were about to get legs. With his new legs, Mr. Fishfingers was unbelievably fast. Almost too fast, in fact. His legs took him further afield than he'd ever gone before. So far, in fact, that he uncovered something he never should have uncovered. Standing in front of him was a giant whelk. The thing about giant whelks is, they are extremely aggressive. Running into a giant whelk can mean only one outcome. And in the midst of all the action, Mr. Pinchy was caught and unceremoniously killed. Mr. Fishfingers was so heartbroken that he decided to remove his legs for good. He then returned to the crab nest where he met Mr. Pinchy Jr. and told him of his predecessor's fate. Mr. Pinchy Jr. swore that the Crustacean Nation would stop at nothing to take the giant whelk down. Although, he then died a couple minutes later. So, maybe, I guess, Mr. Pinchy Jr. Jr. will carry on his grandfather's wishes? In fact, I wonder if there's a video about that. Having struggled through all of this commotion, Mr. Fishfingers and the Salmons had come a very long way, and they finally felt it was time to move into tribal stage. A village was established, and the Salmon took to killing the local population of strawberries for food. Following their lead, Mr. Pinchy Jr. Jr. took the crabs to tribal stage as well, and it wasn't long before a trade route was set up between the two kingdoms. With peace and harmony beginning to spread, Mr. Fishfinger's next move was to build relations with a nearby village of pears. But as he scanned the map, he noticed that one of the Crustacean Nation settlements, the Lavender Village, had been caught in a rather precarious situation. They were about to be attacked by one of the Salmon's greatest enemies, a giant grizzly bear. The bear stomped around, causing absolute chaos, and all the Salmons could do was skid about the place in fear. All Salmon within the vicinity of the Lavender Village turned tail and ran. But whilst they did so, two brave crab warriors went out to meet the bear head on. They approached it with caution, intending to offer a truce. But the bear ripped them to shreds before they even opened their mouths. Mr. Fishfingers knew something needed to be done, and he ordered the manufacturing of all kinds of weapons. The Salmons were going to war. As the battle horn sounded, they skidded their way into formation and fortified the Lavender Village. As they formed ranks, Mr. Fishfingers himself went out to the bear and baited him in. With the bear following just behind, he wriggled as fast as his fins would carry him, and when it got close to the village, the crabs and salmons attacked as one. The battle raged on for seconds, if not minutes of time. The salmon on the front line were doing some serious damage, and the crabs were… well, the crabs weren't doing much. But in the end, it didn't matter. The bear couldn't cope, and it fell to the ground with an earth-splitting thump. The day was saved. Salmons and crabs rejoiced, and even the pears got in on the celebrations. It sure did feel good to live without the tyranny of the grizzly bet. Hold on, who is this? Hearing that one of their giant overlords had been defeated, the Red Bear Nation had taken up arms and moved into the area. They sent out fishermen, rounding up fish from all the surrounding oceans, and with no intent to take this lying down, Mr. Fishfingers grouped up the Salmon Armada and they confidently skidded over to the Red Nation and began their assault. The Red Nation was defeated in an instant, 
but by this point, it seemed an almost endless stream of bears had arrived. The Green Nation and the Purple Nation were now nearby, but an even more pressing matter had befallen the Blue Village, the appearance of yet another giant bear. Luckily, the Blue Nation had a means to defend themselves, and by the time Mr. Fishfingers arrived to help, the bear went down in a single strike. As he made his way back home though, Mr. Fishfingers noticed some purple bears heading in the opposite direction, and it turned out that while he was gone, almost all of their food had been stolen. One unfortunate salmon mercenary was sent out to steal it back. He was supposed to be the salmon's most sneaky recruit, but the mission went about as well as you would think. With fish kind now on the brink of extinction, they gathered all the strength they had and made one last charge. The final march of the salmon. Mr. Fishfingers and his men put up a valiant fight, but the bears were too many, and the salmon never stood a chance. They were defeated, and to this day, no salmon has ever set foot on land again. Ah, <sighs> oh what a day it was to be a bear in the 2008 life simulation game, Spore. The sun was shining, there was plenty of food, and bear society was progressing at an incredible rate under the guidance of First Prime Minister, Barnaby Bear. Having made their way to the top of the animal kingdom, the bears had gained substantial brain power. They now read books, played Monopoly, and one bear even held the speedrun world record for the Mario Kart course Maple Treeway. So the bears began to build their very first settlement. They called it Bear Salona, but to establish a proper tribe would be a difficult task, and because of this, it was to Barnaby Bear's great pleasure that he found they were surrounded on all sides by an almost infinite amount of salmons. If a bear created a restaurant, the menu would probably go as follows. Number one, honey. Number two, marmalade. Number three, picnics and number four, salmons. It was no surprise then when Barnaby ordered the tribe to terrorize, burn, pillage, and eat every single salmon in sight. Some villagers they smoked, others they seasoned. Each batch of salmon was even more delicious than the previous. But not everything was plain sailing, and there were a few minor inconveniences along the way. The most notable was the appearance of a giant whelk. You might be thinking, well, just eat the whelk and be done with it. But come on, even bears have standards. Whelks are tough and chewy and taste of feet. On top of this, they are incredibly strong and also incredibly evil. I heard that they enjoy stealing old women's purses and, and making babies cry. The bears tried their best to take the giant whelk down, but it was far too powerful. And severely wounded, Barnaby and his crew had to take a short fishing break to recover. Meanwhile, the tenacious salmon had mustered the strength to fight back. Taking the initiative, they confronted the bears head on, and the battle was closer than you might think. But Mother Nature is a cruel mistress, and the food chain doesn't lie. The bears did not lose, and they continued their conquest, this time with two healers, just in case they ran into that whelk again. And by the time they were done wiping out the entire salmon population, a grand new scheme was afoot. Having become accustomed to the delicious taste of high quality salmon, Barnaby and the other bears craved something more. They built themselves a cabin as a headquarters and began to brainstorm. One of the bears suggested maybe trying out a bit of nuclear warfare, but this was a terrible idea. Not least because with their big bear claws, they might accidentally press dangerous red buttons. The next bear suggested maybe making tanks, but that seemed overly aggressive as well. The final suggestion was a bit more suitable. What if the bears could bake some fish pies? Hmm, thought everyone. Having wiped out the salmon entirely, it was probably going to be difficult to find any ingredients. The bears would need to find a whole new food source. And then, it hit them. Why were they still focusing on fish? Fish were a thing of the past. What was a bear's number one favorite food? That's right, honey. It was decided. Barnaby Bear would become the owner of the world's biggest honey supply. No, he would go even further 
he would gather all of the honey in the whole planet. With their mission decided, the bears built a city called Birmingham. Jesus Christ. And then worked on engineering some vehicles in the shape of jars so they could scoop up honey wherever they went. By the time they were done, the bear population was beginning to get impatient. But luckily for them, they didn't have to look far to find exactly what they were searching for, as just outside the city walls was their first honey geezer. To the untrained eye, the substance coming out of this geezer might not look like honey, but this is in fact honey in gas form. And you're gonna have to trust me on that, because in real life, honey gas isn't a thing. The bears converted the geezer into a honey factory, and began to harvest its golden elixir. But this was only the beginning, and taking a look at the map, the bears realised just how many honey hotspots this world had. Without further ado, a new fleet of honeypot vehicles set out in all directions to scoop up some more of those honey geezers. And as they did so, the bear empire continued to expand. But just as everything was going smoothly, Barnaby noticed something strange. The honeypot cars he had sent out had not yet returned home. What's more, one by one, they disappeared from his radio comms. Maybe something about being full up with honey was interfering with the car's Wi-Fi signal, he thought. The bears built even more honeypots and sent them out to investigate. But on their way to the site of the disappearances, they discovered something truly terrifying. Towering above them was a giant salmon. With little time to think, the bears had to sneak past by taking a secret route through the mountains. But with its super salmon sensors, this giant salmon was clever, and it managed to intercept them at the end of the pass. The bears wheeled round, ready to go on the offensive. Even a giant salmon was still just a salmon after all. But then... A salmon that could breathe fire? Now this was a problem. If they couldn't pass through the mountains, how would they ever take advantage of all of the wonderful honey on the other side? And then, as if to answer their call, the green nation of bears set up a city nearby. This was a blessing and a curse. Although Barnaby Bear now had competition for his honey empire, the green nation seemed peaceful. And more than that, they provided the giant salmon with a great distraction. Its head was turned by the arrival of some new green vehicles. And while its attention was drawn, the honeypots were able to gather up all the geezers in the surrounding area. The people of Birmingham celebrated this small victory, but their fireworks were premature. And, on the way home, yet another brave crew of bears were caught by the fire-breathing giant salmon. This had gone too far. The bears couldn't continue to tiptoe around this ferocious beast, or it would be the end of them. Barnaby Bear knew the situation called for drastic action, and thus commenced Operation Bear Brotherhood. Searching once again on the map, Barnaby saw that the Green Nation were not his only neighbours. The Cyan Nation and the Blue Nation had also established cities in the area. This was perfect, as his plan involved connecting them through a means that would unite all of their kind. Trading Honey. To bears, trading honey is much like trading Pokemon cards. That is, if every single Pokemon card looked and tasted exactly the same. Without further ado, an even greater honeypot fleet was gathered, and they set out to trade with all three nations. First, the Cyan Nation, who accepted the terms with great joy. Then, the Green Nation, who held the same enthusiasm. Although, this could have been out of fear, as the giant salmon was currently having a bath in the waters next door. Finally, the Blue Nation agreed, and not a moment too soon, as the salmon had finished its dip in the sea and was now laying waste to one of the green cities. The shipments of honey began at once, and whilst the air raid siren sounded in the city of, uh, Wald? Vast amounts of honey was being transported right under the salmon's nose. With trading relationships beginning to grow, the Blue Nation agreed to become part of Barnaby Bear's future empire. But, in Wald, buildings had started to crumble, and there was no time to waste. The honey delivery service ramped up production once more, and the Cyan Nation too agreed to unify themselves under Barnaby's beautiful brown banner. 
It turns out, buying out the Cyan Nation had proved to be a major success. They were a very technologically savvy nation, who had discovered the secrets to aviation as well as seafaring, meaning the honeypots would now be able to conquer the sky and ocean. Barnaby's ships were designed with a huge stack of gold bars on top, to show off the bear's vast wealth, and Barnaby's planes were given a huge bag of money on top, to show off the bear's vast wealth. Barnaby might have been going a bit mad with power at this point, but it was fine. All that was left in Operation Bear Brotherhood was for the bears to acquire some weaponry. By this point, the city of Wald had been renamed to Salmon's Breach because the, the Salmon was currently breaching it. Thankfully, the appearance of a new bear nation, the Pink Nation, held all the answers. The Pink Nation were a very aggressive species of bear, and as such, they had invented all sorts of guns. Having now converted every honey geezer on the mainland, trading with the Pink Nation was pretty easy work, and before long, they were on side. The honeypot planes were then upgraded by strapping two massive cannons to each side, and that meant it was now finally time to take the giant salmon down for good. As it thumped and stomped around, the giant salmon was as intimidating as ever, but before it could devour any more buildings, the city of Salmon's Breach was given hope by the distant rumble of honey-fueled engines. The bear armada were here, and they meant business. They began to spray vast amounts of honey down from above, and the salmon was so sticky that it was unable to maneuver into a fire-breathing position. The honeypot circled around it in a dizzying formation, and, however giant this salmon may be, it could not handle the collective might of the Bear Brotherhood. With a great boom that echoed across the land, the salmon fell, and the day was saved. With the giant salmon out of the way, Barnaby and the Bear Brotherhood could begin to prosper, and they traded all the honey they could to their heart's content. They developed new ways to amass unbelievable riches, such as bulk shipping and aggressive advertisement. They flew blimps with TV screens all around neighbouring cities, singing the praises of their great leader, Barnaby the Salmon Killer Bear. But when all was said and done, Barnaby felt a kind of emptiness. He felt he was in need of a new adventure. So he left his fortune in the hands of his daughter Beatrice and flew away in his honeypot helicopter to a far and distant land. And as he went, he gave his people one last message. My name is Barnaby, and I have all the honey in the world. Now I go in search of some toast to spread it on. Peter had always had one dream, to sail the seven seas on his very own pirate ship. He wanted to scourge every body of water available to him. Yes, one day the entire ocean would be his. Then, as he gazed out upon the big blue horizon, something occurred to him. Who actually owned the ocean? What was stopping him just swimming out and claiming it as his own? In fact, he would do just that. He ran down the beach, into the ocean, and began to swim out as far as he could. This was going to be easy. The ocean would be his in no time. Oh my god, what is that? Oh my god, no! And that's where Peter's story ended, unfortunately, guys. N no, just kidding. As it turned out, the ocean was currently inhabited by a large sea monster. Peter was not yet powerful enough to take on such an enemy. For now then, if he couldn't be the greatest pirate on the seven seas, he would at least try to be the greatest pirate on the beach. With this in mind, Peter began to run up and down the shoreline, searching for places to do piratey things, such as burning, and pillaging, and downloading TV shows for free. Before long, he came across a small community of shrimps. This was perfect, and he began to ransack the shrimps for all that they were worth. Mmm, tasty, thought Peter, and as it turned out, the shrimps weren't the only creatures around. There was a group of catfish as well. More protein for Peter. And then, there was a nest of puffins. What? Uh, Peter was not happy about this. For all he knew, puffins were just a bunch of penguin wannabes. 
He would not stand for these no-good impersonators on his beach. Peter launched into an attack, but the Puffins outnumbered him, and he had to make a tactical retreat. What followed was a rather intense chase scene, but in the end, he managed to get away, and he returned home to find a strange shell had appeared at the Penguin's base. Weird, but Peter thought nothing of it, and he treated it as another free protein meal. This gave him the extra bit of strength he needed, and after teaming up with one of his best friends, Percy the Penguin, they headed back to the Puffin's Nest and showed them who was boss. With the beach now well and truly his, Peter was feeling ready to spread his wings further afield. Of course, he still wouldn't be able to fly or anything, but maybe it was finally time for Peter to venture out into the ocean and conquer it once and for all. Oh god, no. Okay, maybe it was still a bit too early, actually. Instead, Peter decided he would work his way up bit by bit, and he set out to find a smaller body of water more befitting of his current stature. He and Percy travelled far, raiding more puffins as they went. They saw many peculiar sights, the skeleton of a huge creature from times gone by, another nest of penguins that greeted them warmly, and then another peculiar shell, just like the one from before, except this one was bobbing up and down on the horizon. Oh no, it couldn't be. Peter was in trouble. He had just run straight into a giant whelk. The whelk snarled at them with a menacing grimace, and then, in a flash, it was darting straight towards them. Peter ran as fast as his little flippers would carry him, but the whelk was gaining on them. It was going to catch them. That's when Percy turned around and made the ultimate sacrifice. He faced the whelk head on, buying Peter just enough time to be able to escape unscathed. With the devastating passing of his one and only friend, Peter had almost forgotten about his grudge match with the sea monster. His new nemesis was the giant whelk, and he knew exactly what he had to do to defeat him. Peter was going to assemble the greatest pirate crew there had ever been. He would search heaven and earth for the most fearless and brutal warriors around, and with a renewed sense of purpose, he set out again on another journey. He hadn't been travelling long, however, before he began to hear the pattering of footsteps behind him. He turned around, and to his surprise, he was being followed by a small, adorable elephant. Peter was not in the mood. This elephant was far too cute, and he ignored it and kept on moving. But the elephant seemed to be following him wherever he went. After walking for quite some time with the elephant shadowing his every step, he came across the thing he'd been looking for all this time. A little pool of water, just the right size for a small penguin like him. The elephant had been escorting him here. Peter thanked him with all his heart, and invited him to be the first member of his pirate crew. Together, they pronounced this small bit of water as their very first piece of ocean, and they took the time to have a good splash about before moving onwards. As the day wore on, the good fortune did not end there. As, just a short journey away from Peter's new pond, he stumbled across some of the perfect candidates to be his second crewmate. It was a bunch of trout. Peter made friends with the trout by singing them one of his favourite sea shanties, and with the help of the small elephant trumpeting away in the back, the bravest trout of them all, a fish named Timothy, was nominated to join their pirate crew. Together, the three of them felt unstoppable, and the rest of Creature Stage was a breeze. They went around the place beating up puffins and singing sea shanties without a care in the world. The crew discovered bigger and bigger bits of water. They encountered monkeys, tiny men, and bears, who they couldn't stay around for too long as they were licking their lips in Timothy Trout's direction. Time flew by, and eventually, Peter was trying on his new sailor's hat, which indicated he was more than ready to move into tribal stage. The penguins built themselves a village, and the small elephant took up its position as town guard. To find the group a fitting meal for their first night in the village, Peter had taken himself out on a fishing trip. As he was scouting out the local shoreline, and thinking about the process of designing his very first pirate ship, what he discovered on his travels was nothing short of catastrophic. A whole tribe of whelks had moved into the area, and, as if this situation couldn't get any worse, they were being overseen by the giant whelk himself. 
Peter sprinted back to base and alerted the other penguins. They immediately set about weaponizing themselves with pointed spears. As they did so though, it occurred to Peter that an all-out battle was not necessarily the pirate's way. No, no. Instead, he would devise a cunning plan. He himself would approach the Welks alone. He would sneak behind enemy ranks and steal all of their food supplies. And it was whilst the Welks were weakened by hunger that the penguins would make their move. Putting his plan into action, Peter circumnavigated the Welk settlement, making sure to be as sneaky as possible. However, when he reached the food supplies, the Welks turned around all at once, and he was caught red-flippered. In a flash, he was pinned down by their sharp jaws. But, against all the odds, during the following chase, he managed somehow to give them the slip. Inspired by Peter's stealth and dexterity, the rest of the Penguin Village wanted to give thievery a try. Soon, the Welks found themselves fighting against a constant stream of penguin robbers. In fact, the penguins were smuggling so much food that even the giant Welk was beginning to pay attention, and he ordered his Welk mercenaries to launch into a counterattack. With every one of the penguins so preoccupied by the thrill of the heist, the Welks essentially had a free shot at the penguin's base. But, as reliable as ever, the small elephant defended the penguin settlement with all his might keeping the Welks at bay almost long enough for Peter to return. His effort was nothing short of heroic. But, in the end, the Welks were too much. And, in a tragic turn of events, the small elephant was defeated. With a burst of anger and rage, Peter and the Penguins returned to the scene with a vengeance. The Welks would pay for what they had done. Peter swore revenge on every single one of them, from normal size to giant. The small elephant may have returned to the heavenly realm from which he came, but down here on Earth there was a score to settle. Right here, and right now. The pirate penguin armada flooded across the battlefield, like a wave on which they one day dreamed to sail. They took out whelk after whelk in an arduous brawl. And, after the final whelk had fallen, they burnt their town hall to nothing but ash and dust. The giant whelk was furious and the penguins had to run for their little penguin lives once more. Normal sized whelks were one thing, but this titanous sea snail was going to be a whole different prospect. Despite this though, Peter was determined to avenge the passing of his adorable little friend, and he still had one card left to play. He ordered the penguins on an emergency fishing mission. The crew was confused. Fishing? At a crucial time such as this? But what happened next? would leave them all stunned. For Peter had experience with a foe even more fearsome than the giant whelk. And, as they often say in the penguin community, yesterday's enemy is tomorrow's friend. It's a common saying amongst penguins, just, just trust me on that. Peter and the penguins looked out towards the ocean and began to sing their famous sea shanties one final time. From somewhere deep below the surface, who else but the huge sea monster answered their call. The great green beast swished his tail, flinging water high into the air, and a barrage of strange fish rained down upon the penguin crew. They took the fish home and served up a great banquet, a feast for the ages, and upon eating these magical fish, the penguins were granted unbelievable strength. It was now or never. They grabbed their spears, formed ranks once more, and with the will of the great sea monster driving them onwards, and thoughts of the small elephant in their hearts, they faced the giant whelk head on. The whelk was as tough as ever, but Peter and his crew were prepared. They attempted to confuse the whelk by making quick darts from side to side, taking advantage of its poor maneuverability. Eventually, after a huge effort, and many, many spears thrown, the whelk could take it no more and it fell to the ground with an earth-shattering thud. The penguins were victorious, and with nothing else standing in his way, Peter's dream now seemed more possible than ever. He was able to finish designing his very own pirate ship, and before he knew it, it was floating on the ocean and ready to set sail. It cut through the waves like a knife through butter. Peter felt the wind ruffling his feathers, and his maiden voyage was everything he had ever hoped for. Here, on his ship, 
he finally felt at home, and they sailed onwards for days and days and days. In time, they sailed so far that the ocean around them turned from blue to green. What? Something wasn't right here. A sinister presence started to surround them, and it was only a few moments before they found out why. No, but they had defeated it. How could it be here now? Unless there was more than one giant whelk. And so the story ends. Peter's ship never did return from its first adventure, but it's not all doom and gloom. For those few who know the Seven Seas best often tell tales of a mysterious ghost ship passing by every now and then, filled to the brim with pirate's treasure and manned by a crew of penguins. In the outer reaches of space, on this, a planet not too dissimilar from our own, there lives one creature so evil, so despicably horrible, that very few even dare to speak its name. To many, it is known simply as the Common Sea Snail. But, for those brave enough to voice its true title, it is known only as the Welk. His name was Wilfred, and he was a Welk. A Welk with big ambitions. Up until now, Wilfred had had a peaceful life, living under his shell in a place known as the Welk Zone. To outsiders, it was a dangerous place, littered with the bones of unfortunate passers-by, and cursed by rumours of black magic. But to him, it had always been home. Despite what its name implied, the Welk Zone was in fact home to many different species of sea creature, all of which one day dreamed of world domination. There was the shrimps, who would conquer the world through happiness. There was the hermit crabs, who would take over the world with kindness. And there were the catfish, who would conquer the world with friendship. But Wilfred knew the Welks weren't like these other soft-hearted species. You could say they were built different. They weren't afraid to get their hands dirty, and he was sure that in time, they would be the ones to take over the entire planet. Wilfred was determined to contribute towards the Welk's inevitable success. He wanted to write his name in the history books, and with this in mind, he sought guidance from the Council of Welks. The Council was comprised of the wisest but most mysterious members of the community. They encircled him on all sides, and before he even had time to ask for advice, they began to tell him his prophecy. He was the Chosen One, destined to be a great warrior, a symbol of strength and power that would spearhead their conquest. It was to this end that he was invited to enlist in the official Welk training regime, and he was assigned his very own supervisor, a prestigious Welk by the name of Chief Commander Shellworth. Wilfred travelled with his new instructor, and it wasn't long before they began lesson number one. His first task was to gather as many skeletons as possible. Wilfred didn't think this would be too difficult, as the Welk Zone was of course covered in skeletons. According to Chief Commander Shellworth, Welks get the majority of their power from the bones of their enemies. The only thing they ate more than bones was Putty Falu yogurt. Wilfred went around picking up all of the fossils he could find, and with each one, he felt himself growing stronger. He also insisted on making this weird noise while he did so. I'm not too sure what that was about, but with enough energy stored up inside him, Shellworth decided that Wilfred was ready to learn the sacred technique. First though, they had to find someone to practice on. Wilfred recalled the nest of hermit crabs from earlier, but hermit crabs are very nervous creatures, and they all ran away. This would not do, and searching elsewhere, they came across a nest of puffins. The puffins stood their ground. After all, they ate whelks for breakfast on the daily. These would be perfect. Shellworth instructed Wilfred to tense all of his intestines at once. Bit weird, thought Wilfred, but he did as he was ordered, and before long, he felt the tension and power building up inside of him. 
Well, it was either that or he was feeling very, very sick. Eventually, the tension was too much to hold in, and he exploded in a burst of fury. Flames erupted from inside him, and the puffin was burnt to a crisp. The sacred technique was fire breathing. Wilfred felt unstoppable. The puffin stood no chance, and he swiftly turned them all into charcoal. Lesson one complete, it was time for task number two. Wilfred was going to learn to charge. There was one small problem with this. Welks only had one foot. Therefore, any charging they did had to be done by hopping. Shellworth led him back to the Hermit Crab's base. Wilfred didn't quite understand. If he hopped towards the crabs now, surely they would just run away again. But Chief Commander Shellworth had it all figured out. He instructed Wilfred to build tension as he had done before. Only this time, instead of tensing his intestines, he would focus the tension into his one foot. He did so, and the pressure became so intense that Wilfred sprang forwards, and he was launched so far he collided with his target and sent the Hermit Crab into a daze. Wow. Combined with his fireball attack, this was going to be a deadly combo. Drunk on his newfound power, Wilfred and Shellworth went around the neighborhood, causing carnage and destruction wherever they went. By the time they were done, almost every other sea creature in the Welk Zone had been driven to extinction. All except for one. And this constituted the third and final part of Wilfred's training. He would have to defeat a beast so horrible that it kept the Welks from leaving the Welk Zone all of this time. It sent shivers down the shell of even Chief Commander Shellworth. Frog monsters. But, unfazed and more determined than ever, Wilfred used his charge to dart into action. The frog monsters piled on top of him, but he sent fireball after fireball into the fray, and they began to fall one by one. In no time at all, he had the upper hand. It was frog's legs for dinner, boys, char grilled and roasted to perfection. Wilfred had proved himself a formidable soldier. The frog monsters were made extinct, and his training was complete. With nothing more to prove, Wilfred made the arduous journey all the way back to his home nest, where, eagerly awaiting his return, the Council of Welks had gathered once again. They welcomed him with much enthusiasm. He had done a great job, they said. It was exactly as the prophecy had foretold. All he had to do now was bathe in the Crimson Sea, and he would transform into the ultimate Welk champion. Wilfred was happy beyond words. He rushed to the shore and dipped himself straight into the dark red ocean. Yes, he could feel it. He was transforming into the hero of his dreams. It was amazing, but... Oh, as he stepped out of the ocean, nothing seemed to have changed. Perhaps he did something a bit wrong. No matter, he was sure the Council of Welsh would have a perfectly good explanation for this, but as he returned, he began to hear the distant sound of Gregorian chanting. The Council was singing a hymn of sorts, a kind of ritual song. That was strange. The music was stirring an unusual feeling inside him. He started to get dizzy, and the world began to spin. He was feeling angry. But he wasn't just angry, he was full of rage. A rage that was swelling, getting bigger and bigger and bigger until... He was giant. This must have been what the council had meant. He was so big, the biggest whelk ever to exist and he was going to cause more chaos and destruction than anyone could imagine. Yes. Run, little hermit crabs. Run in fear. Wilfred stomped across the land, laying waste to anyone who fell in his path. Puffins cowered in terror. Even monkeys became nothing but sport. He was the one true god of this wor- Wait. Hang on. This wasn't right. There was a whelk that was bigger than him. Impossible, but the council said, Oh God! He plunged back into the Crimson Sea. He needed more, more size, more power. 
He grew and grew and grew until he was the size of a building, taller than the tallest of skyscrapers. Now, surely he was the greatest around. He could take down bears in a single swipe, crush pears with a moment's notice, and yet, no. Still, there were whelks just as big as him. It couldn't be. The council had lied. Did this mean he wasn't the chosen one? Was it all just a stitch up? A ploy to make Wilfred one of their mindless, angry soldiers? Well, it had made him angry all right, but there was no way in seven hells he would fall in line with these other brain dead fools. He was special. He was the chosen one and he would prove it. Wilfred used all of his combat skills to take the other giant whelks down. Surely this would show them. They would have to see that he was different. He was supposed to be a hero. He was supposed, supposed to be. And then everything went blank. It had all gone to plan. The Council of Whelks had managed to create an army of super soldiers and in no time at all, they had taken over the world. But their greed was not yet satisfied, and through more horrible experiments and devious witchcraft, they stumbled upon an even greater evil. A portal between worlds, a rip in the space-time continuum known as the Menu. They now had access to worlds they never even knew existed and this would allow them to send giant whelks to parallel universes. They sent whelks to dimensions ruled by salmons and bears, to a far off place full of crabs known as the Crustacean Nation, to a world ruled by pirate penguins that sailed the high seas, and finally to a world full of fruit ruled by pears. The Welks tore across each existence, leaving a trail of devastation in their wake. One by one, whole civilizations were terrorized, and in some cases, completely wiped out. This had to stop, or reality itself would be nothing but Welks. The universe had reached its final hour, and in the face of extinction, it was time for the real heroes to step up. There were so many allies to gather. Frutius Maximus had work to do. Since setting out on his intergalactic journey, Frutius Maximus had traveled a long, long way through space. He now found himself atop a small hill on a planet inhabited by nothing more than snow and ice. This place wasn't very pleasant, but just as he was about to get up and leave, all of a sudden, his radio transceiver began to ring. It was his best friend in the world, Perfessor Layton. But instead of a happy reunion, the Perfessor brought terrible news. Apparently, giant whelks were invading the entire universe. And in even worse news, his home, a place known as the Pearlanet Earth, had been torn to ruins. It was a massacre, the Perfessor said even worse than that one time with all of the evil bananas. This was bad. Frutius had to do something, but he was so far away from anywhere and everything. If what the Perfessor said was true, he couldn't do this on his own. He would need help from some of the universe's greatest heroes. The problem being that all of the heroes he knew of were either dead or missing. Thankfully, Frutius had invented a time machine. Perhaps if he made a few tweaks to his spaceship, he could reprogram it to fly backwards through history, and this way he could find himself some allies. Putting his plan into action, Frutius jumped aboard his ship and flew out into the great unknown. For some reason he chose to ride on top of his spaceship rather than inside it, probably because p pears only have short arms and it was easier just to put the autopilot on or, or something like that. Before he knew it though, the time machine had kicked in and his mission had begun. His first port of call was a place known as the Crustacean Nation. One of his old comrades, a crab known as Mr. Pinchy Jr. Jr., was rumored to have been defeated here by none other than a group of pears. Frutius didn't want to believe it. Pears were a peaceful species, and Mr. Pinchy was a wonderful little guy. 
He was convinced he was missing part of the story, and his suspicions were confirmed when he discovered the neighboring village were under the control of a giant whelk. To think that members of his own species had been brainwashed by nothing but a big sea snail. He had to find some way to snap them out of it. Hmm, yes, there was only one thing for it. He would have to play some royalty-free music. On his planet, Pez didn't have any money, so they bonded through the shared experience of avoiding copyright. Fruitius opened up a maraca shop, and once everyone had an instrument in hand, they went over to the neighbouring village and played a bunch of the finest royalty-free tunes. This went down a huge success, and the Pez agreed to join Fruitius in his quest. To thank them, Fruitius bestowed them with a bunch of didgeridoos. Now it was time to get Mr. Pinchy on side. As one, they travelled over to Mr. Pinchy's settlement and held a concert full of yet more royalty-free vibes. Just as you would expect, the crabs were incredibly impressed, and Mr. Pinchy agreed to join Fruitius's crew. Now that everyone here was on the same page, there was only one matter left to deal with. The giant whelk. Upon seeing it, Fruitius was scared. It was every bit as terrifying and intimidating as Professor Layton had described, but he was determined to save his home. And, with the combined strength of Mr. Pinchy and the other pairs, there was really nothing to worry about. Though the battle was arduous, the giant whelk was eventually defeated. Fruitius Maximus was filled with relief. Having great friends like Mr. Pinchy at his side was definitely the way forward. He shared his time machine technology with Mr. Pinchy and told him to meet him again on the Pear Lanet Earth. He would have explained his plan in more detail, but crabs have very poor attention spans and Mr. Pinchy wasn't interested. With this, they bid each other farewell. For Fruitius though, the journey was far from over. And his next stop was not the Pear Lanet Earth, it was in fact the Bear Lanet Earth. Rumour had it that two great soldiers by the names of Barnaby Bear and Mr. Fishfingers lived here. When he first arrived, however, he was greeted by a different face. A trout by the name of Timothy. Timothy Trout offered to guide Fruitius to the people he was seeking, but he warned him things were not currently going so well. A war had broken out between bears and salmons, as, to quote Barnaby Bear, salmons were just too tasty and he couldn't resist. As they approached their destination, Fruitius experienced this animosity firsthand. He was caught in the middle of a huge battle, and, with no intention of being eaten just yet, he was forced to run away. It seemed he would have to greet them one at a time, and, when the fighting had died down, he went first to the Salmon Village. Fruitius befriended them using his signature pair charms. However, just as he began to teach them about the joys of royalty-free music, they heard battle cries from across the way. The bear village was being attacked by a giant whelk! Oh god, these whelks really were everywhere! But hang on, this was the perfect opportunity. Fruitius informed Mr. Fishfingers of the giant whelk's situation, and with great maturity, the salmon swallowed their pride put their beef aside, and marched on over to offer the bears support. Working as one, the salmons and bears were not just able to defeat one whelk, but two more after that. They were a ferocious team, and they fought with real tenacity. Well, actually, most of them just sort of waited around at the back, but the point still stands. Having now fought together instead of against each other, the bears agreed to stop eating salmons, and switched instead to a diet of whelks and honey. Fruitius Maximus had made two more allies, and, as before, he gave them each a time machine and instructed them to meet him on his home planet. Before that, Fruitius had to make one third and final stop, and in this case when he travelled through time and space, he arrived half-submerged in the middle of the ocean. As he swam to shore and shook himself dry, he noticed, off in the distance, that someone was in trouble. A small, adorable elephant was fighting all on its own against three or four whelks. He rushed in to save it. Fruitius didn't understand how anyone could hurt a small elephant as cute as this. One by one, he took out the whelks, and once they were all defeated, he and the elephant made friends. The adorable elephant led Fruitius to what can only be described as an elephant utopia. And, trading stories around the campfire, 
Fruity has found out that this elephant used to be the vice captain of a pirate ship. But he had been separated from his crew during a raid on a Welk village and hadn't seen them since. Fruitius and the rest of the elephants agreed to help find them. They set out as a group, and it wasn't long before they saw a mast and sail peeking over the horizon. As they got closer, they noticed a gang of penguins, shipwrecked and bobbing up and down in the water. This must have been the pirates they were looking for, but upon closer inspection, the captain was nowhere to be found. This was bad news, as Fruitius had been banking on recruiting Peter the Penguin as the final part of his task force. If only there were a way to find him. Oh, no, wait, there he is. With the addition of Peter, Fruitius' squad was now complete. He bestowed him with yet another time machine, and Peter and the Penguins fixed up their ship and sailed away. All that was left to do now was convene with everyone else on the Pear Planet Earth. He arrived on his home planet for the first time in what felt like forever. Professor Layton was waiting to greet him, but immediately it was made obvious just how dire the Welk situation was getting. Straight away, Fruitius and the Professor had to save a bunch of plums from imminent extinction. Once the coast was clear, however, they travelled over to the meeting area. This was it. The greatest heroes from all around the universe gathered in one place. With these fabled protectors, they may just have a chance at salvation. Even so, there was only a few of them, and the odds were stacked heavily against their favour. But this was no time to get discouraged. Fruitius stood between them and began to speak. He gave a rousing speech, which I'm going to have to cut for the sake of time. You're just going to have to trust me here. The guy went on for like an hour. It was just a bunch of waffling, but with everyone pumped up and raring to go, they all jumped aboard Fruitius' spaceship and flew directly towards the giant rip in space. Well, they would have flown directly there if Fruitius hadn't been driving, but with his short arms, it was hard to go in a straight line. Eventually, though, they took off into space and reached the mysterious realm known as the menu. As they flew further and further through it, the weather began to turn for the worst. Lightning struck the ship's hull, the pressure began to mount, and everything began to shake violently. Before they knew it, the whole ship burst into flames, and they were going to crash. They wouldn't make it, they were... <gasps> Fruitius awoke in a world like none he'd ever seen before. They had made it. Somehow, they had ended up in the Welk Zone. Cursed by dark sorcery, the Welk Zone was a melting pot of ash and smoke. A huge fortress built of charred stone imposed threateningly upon the burning red sky. Ranks and ranks of Welks stood snarling on the horizon, overshadowed only by their giant counterparts behind them. There were so many of them, it was a whole army! Fruitius began to question whether this was even possible. But no, he thought to himself, they had come this far, there was no backing out now. And besides, he wasn't alone. Yes, if the Welks wanted a war, they would give them a war. This was it, the time was now at hand. And, with a final rallying cry, Fruitius and the gang charged into battle. They would meet the Welks head on, but... Uh-oh. Oh god. Oh no. Oh, there's too many of them. Oh god, what the hell is going on? An overwhelming amount of chaos ensued. Every member of Fruitius's crew was swamped by a wave of Welks. One moment, Fruitius was pushing through a dense crowd. The other, he was making a break between defensive lines. His friends were fighting bravely, and many Welks were being defeated. But it seemed for every Welk they took down, there were 10, maybe 20 more. Eventually, Fruitius was so surrounded that he could do nothing but spin on a mound of shells and teeth. Perhaps they had underestimated the size of the task. How could just a handful of courageous heroes take down an entire army? It seems that Fruitius' mission to save the universe was over before it ever really began. But then... A trumpet sounded from somewhere off in the distance. Fruitius thought the worst. Surely not more Welks. There was too many of them already. But 
what he saw made his little pear heart nearly jump from his chest. Coming over the hill was a brigade of bananas and a whole horde of long boys. It was incredible! How did they get here? Fruitius thought he might be hallucinating, but sure enough, the reinforcements had come in their plenty. A sea of yellow on two fronts, all streaming towards the battlefield as one. Whether he was dreaming or awake, Fruitius didn't care. They now had the numbers to do some real damage, and in no time at all, the Welk's front line was well and truly broken. The Bananas had real stamina, thanks to their high supplies of potassium, and the Long Boys were so long, so, so long. The question still remained, how did they get here? The answer though, was right in front of them. It was Bananakin Skywalker. Bananakin told them he had received a call for aid from Fruitius' right-hand man, Perfessor Layton. He reassured Fruitius that he and his army would take care of the front lines. It was Fruitius and his friend's job then, to take care of a more deadly foe. The Giant Welks. Six of them stood guard in front of a monumental gate. It was Fruitius' best guess that behind those walls, the mastermind of this whole crisis was waiting. If they could somehow make it through and defeat the Welk's one true leader, their empire would crumble and the universe would be saved. Now, there was quite a few sizeable issues with this plan, but the most pressing was the fact that Fruitius had only ever taken down two giant Welks in one place, let alone six. Despite this though, he couldn't think of any other way. There was nothing for it. They would just have to try their best. Throwing caution to the wind, Fruitius and the gang charged forwards. The very ground beneath them shook as the giant whelks stomped up and down in fury. With all seven of them focusing their efforts in one place, they managed to get the better of one. But it was obvious from the very beginning that they were completely outmuscled. For now, they still had a fighting chance, but if this battle alone nearly finished them off, how were they ever going to face what was on the other side of these gates? What's more, with Fruitius' ship destroyed as they journeyed through the menu, they had no means of escape if things did get really bad. And with this in mind, Fruitius came up with a hasty plan. He instructed the two smallest and most nimble members of the team, the Elephant and the Plum, to make a dash around the side and scout out what was ahead. If they could find some point of advantage, or better yet, some unseen back route around these walls, it could allow them to bypass the giant whelks entirely. As trustworthy and noble as ever, the small elephant led his adorable plum companion around the side of the fray. They snuck through the gate and behind the wall. As they passed through, immediately in front of them was what appeared to be some form of whelk gathering. The small elephant was too afraid to check it out, and he sprinted past them before they would even notice. Because of this, as fortune would have it, he and the plum stumbled across just what they were looking for. Some kind of strange car in the shape of a jar of honey. It was a vehicle usually driven by the inhabitants of Barnaby Bear's nation. The Welks must have stolen it and brought it back here, but they were currently stripping it for parts. The small elephant wasn't going to let some whelks destroy his friend's property, and he and the plum charged in and began to wreak havoc. The two of them together made a surprisingly strong partnership, and they gave the whelks a good beating. Phew, well, that was their escape plan sorted. But, just as they began to celebrate their unexpected victory, a much more menacing opponent appeared. A whelk of the giant variety. Both Elephant and Plum cowered in terror. They were done for. This was the end. But that was strange. The Welks seemed to be frozen in a sort of daze. As it turned out, this giant Welk was not quite the same as the others. His name was Wilfred. And thanks to the sheer adorableness of the two creatures in front of him, he had just regained his consciousness. Wilfred was unsure as to what was going on. The last thing he remembered, he was being turned into a giant brainless killing machine. Oh, wait, he still kind of was one. No matter, the important thing was, he had his mind back. And right now, the only thing he wanted to do was help this cute little elephant and this adorable little plum. 
They informed him that their friends were in trouble and asked if he was willing to help. Of course, he agreed, and together they walked along the coast, ventured back around the front of the walls, and it was now Wilfred's time to shine. He used his signature fire-breathing technique to send a volley of flames into the fray. These giant whelks might have matched Wilfred in stature, but he now had something they didn't. Friends to protect, a reason to fight. Wilfred took out two, then three, then four giant whelks all by himself. But even he was not invincible, and tragically, as he faced off against his final opponent, he suffered a fatal blow. As he fell to the ground, Wilfred did not feel sad or unfulfilled, for in his final moments, he had finally become what he always dreamed of being, the ultimate Welk hero. Thanks to Wilfred's great sacrifice, Fruteus and his crew were able to take out the final giant Welk, and it was now time to find out what lay beyond these foreboding walls. After passing through the gate, they found an ominous stone circle surrounded by a sinister magical haze. The sound of Gregorian chanting grew louder as they approached, and soon enough, they were face to face with the Council of Welks. All five members stood there holding their weapons of choice. One held a flaming torch, another a giant stick, the third had a magic staff, the fourth a sword, and the fifth was holding some sort of camping mallet? Maybe he was going to put up a tent or something, I don't know. Five Welks, five heroes. It seems that fate had decided proceedings. And, as the first member of the council stepped forwards, it was up to Fruteus and his friends to nominate their first champion. With great courage, Mr. Pinchy proposed himself to go first. As he stepped into the ring, he thought about all the pain and struggle the giant whelks had caused his crustacean nation. The 1v1 commenced. Mr. Pinchy Jr. Jr. charged in fast, and began to exact his revenge with the fury of all Mr. Pinchy's before him. But then, he got bored, and he noticed that the whelk had dropped its weapon. Mr. Pinchy took the opportunity to swipe it from under its feet. He thought briefly about running away with it, but resolved instead to chuck it back in its face. This had no noticeable effect, but it was funny, and Mr. Pinchy was so entertained, he did it again a second time. Having satisfied his terrible attention span, Mr. Pinchy did eventually decide to take the fight seriously, and he beat up the Welk in no time at all, grabbing the victory in round one. The second member of the council stepped forwards. This time, Mr. Fish Fingers volunteered. Having seen Mr. Pinchy steal the Welk's weapon, he too wanted to give this a try. He swiped the big stick from under the Welk's nose and ran around with it in his mouth. In fact, Mr. Fishfingers was having so much fun running around in circles that Fruteus Maximus decided he was taking too long and he stepped in to finish the round for him. The third round followed a similar pattern. Peter the Penguin volunteered for this one, as this Welk was carrying a sword. And, as a pirate, Peter was very familiar. He too was able to disarm the Welk, steal its weapon, and run around it in circles. But Peter was so nimble that the Welk fell over out of sheer dizziness, and he was able to finish it off with ease. The fourth round was no more difficult. Barnaby Bear was able to outstrength his opponent no problem. And, when it came to Fruteus Maximus's turn, he was feeling a little underwhelmed. The Council of Welks had really not been all they were cracked up to be. He supposed, therefore, that he would just march up to the final Welk, hit it with a quick one-two and then, oh god, it was shooting fireballs at him! This wasn't in the plan! Fruteus ducked and weaved as best he could, but the final Welk's fireballs were very accurate. Perhaps this was the Welk behind the whole operation. He was much tougher than the others. He didn't even flinch when his own hammer was thrown back into his face. How would Fruteus overcome such an opponent? But, oh... Out of nowhere, the final Welk keeled over. Mr. Fishfingers had nipped him from behind. And with that, the Council of Welks had been defeated. A spooky silence fell about the Welk Zone. Had they done it? Was it over? It seemed almost too good to be true. It was all too anticlimactic. Had Fruteus's mission been completed? Unfortunately, the answer was no. 
Just a moment later, the peace was broken by an earth-shattering screech. And, as it happened, one final whelk still stood. This must be him, the true master behind it all. He was the Council of Whelk's most powerful member. Standing high above the rest, it was the Whelk King. It was the biggest, most humongous giant Whelk any of them had ever seen. Fruitius and the crew prepared to charge into battle one final time. But before they could, the Whelk shook the ground so hard that a huge plume of lava sprung from below. The gang set off running, attempting to close the distance inch by inch, whilst avoiding a barrage of flames and fireballs. The earth shuddered and spewed out more ash, but eventually, Fruitius did manage to get within striking distance. For a moment, he felt the weight of the whole universe on his shoulders, but it need only be for a moment, as, in a flash, his friends were once again by his side. They fought with all their might shoulder to shoulder, supporting each other just as they had done all of this time. The King of Whelks snarled and snapped and screamed, but they did not give up, not for a single second. They battered the Whelk King until their arms were heavy and their knuckles raw. After everything, finally, with a thud that was heard across the totality of space, the King fell to the ground and the Whelks were no more. Without its rightful ruler, the Welk Zone became unstable. This planet was collapsing, and Fruitius and his crew needed to escape quickly. Led by the small elephant, they rushed together through thick clouds of smog, eventually reaching their honeypot-shaped getaway vehicle. They all jumped in and set off as fast as their wheels would spin. Towering infernos erupted from the soil beneath them, but Fruitius Maximus put his foot to the floor, swerved his way past the explosions towards the horizon, and drove headfirst back through the rip in space-time. Out, once again, in to the unknown. And so, the story ends. Peace had been restored to even the smallest corners of this vast, magnificent universe. Millions and billions of children would grow up without fear of whelks of any form, all thanks to the endeavours of those brave few heroes. What happened next to Fruitius and his friends is a topic of much debate and speculation. Perhaps, as some said, they never made it home through that treacherous rip in space-time. Or maybe, just maybe, they had set off once more for another adventure inside the 2008 life simulation game, Spore.